Good morning, everyone. Uh, so a lot of discussion going on in chat right now. Let's go with green checks if you can hear me. And uh, you ready to go? Star Wars, we got snow, we got Christmas. You guys got it all happening today. There we go. Uh, we have a lot to get through today. I want to finish up the domain and range stuff that we were looking at yesterday. As well, I want to get through lesson three. Lesson three isn't a particularly long lesson, uh, but it's just a few pages because of some charts and graphs and things like that. So it might look a little bit longer than it is. Um, I'm going to assume that nobody has any questions from the work from last day other than maybe this domain and range stuff, which I'm going to go through anyways. But if you have anything, uh, you can go ahead and put it in chat and I'll see if I can get to it. I'm going to go through the rest of these questions and then we'll jump into the other worksheet. So if nobody has anything extremely pressing, um, we'll just continue on. So where we kind of left off yesterday was uh, finding the domain range of these um, questions. Taylor, you have a page three, number five from the learning guide. Um, let's go look at that. Page three. Number five, uh, below are some features of linear equations. Yeah, the I kind of feel bad that this stuff's even in here. Some of the linear equation stuff is actually pops up into uh, the lesson that we do today. So I'm going to kind of get back to this, and then hopefully it'll make a bit more sense. We'll spend some time talking about linear and nonlinear. And um, I think I probably went a little too far with lesson two into the learning guide. So if you got that far, awesome. If not, the problem that I run into a little bit is that the material in the textbook that we I'm familiar with teaching out of is a little different in order than the learning guide and the, the lessons in the course. So just do my best to take all of my, um, my material and kind of mold it to fit the course. And some of the stuff's a bit out of place. So um, number four on page five. Page five, number four. Oh boy. One, two, three. There's no page five, number four. Page four, number five. Uh, with the circle. We'll do almost the exact um, exact question in the, uh, the work here in a second. So uh, hold off on that one for now. Uh, what's the difference between a set notation and an interval notation? Set notation, interval notation. I'm thinking, Alex, when we're talking about sets, we are going to use our uh, curvy brackets like that. So that would be set notation for our, our curvy brackets. And um, interval notation, we're going to use either square brackets or round brackets. And remember, we talked about this yesterday, a square bracket means a a uh, closed dot and an, a round bracket means an open dot. So I'm thinking you guys are all running into the same sort of vocabulary sort of things. A um, few other questions. I was wondering what set notation, interval notation, and lists are for questions five and six, page four and five. Uh, what about lists? Page four and five. Let's go have a look at what it's talking about there. Uh, for, for each of the five ways below, can you list the domain and range? A list. Hmm. I'm not sure what it's getting at there. I might have to go into the lesson online and look at it. Uh, words is easy enough. A number line you guys can probably do. A list I'm not sure about. Uh, set notation. Not sure about interval notation is the brackets, the square and round that we've been looking at. So I'll, I'll look into that uh, today and I'll get back to you guys tomorrow on that. I'm not sure what they, they're looking for. I've never seen domain and range in terms of a list or a set. Uh, I have a feeling it's probably something we've already done. I just called it something different. So it's just kind of one of these vocabulary type things. Uh, what I do want to do is just power through some of this lesson two stuff because I want to get it done. Um, so we started talking about domain and range and last night I was kind of thinking like maybe an easier way to talk about these sorts of things is to kind of think about 
if I had uh, like a light bulb, if I'm talking about my domain, those are my, my x-axis here, so this horizontal axis, if I had maybe like a light bulb up here, apologize for my light bulb, it's not going to be very good, there we go, uh, my light bulb is going to cast a shadow onto this x-axis, and if I had another light bulb at the bottom, uh, it's going to cast a shadow as well, and these points are all going to kind of have their shadow cast onto that x-axis. So if you want to think about it kind of like that, maybe if that makes more sense, that'll work as well. Uh, really the domain is the x variables that it's, the graph is using. So what x variables am I using here? Well, I, I'm using this one here. Uh, this one, it's in the middle is x is 0. And it turns out that these two points are both using the same x value. So what is my domain? Now, my, my points aren't connected with a line, so I can't include all of the points, say, from here to here. Uh, I don't want to use those because those aren't included. So when I'm writing my domain, it's just going to be a set of kind of discrete points. So my x values I'm going to use, I'm going to count it out. Looks like this is negative 6 over here. So negative 6 is negative 5. So I'm going to negative 6, negative 5. I have zero right in the middle, so there's zero, and then counting out here, this is at five. So those are the only x points I'm going to use, and it might be that uh, the list that they were talking about in the uh, learning guide might be just like this. So those are all my x values. My y values is going to be the same process, except instead of looking at the horizontal axis, now I'm looking at uh, the vertical axis. If you put them in brackets like that, oh, that's fine. Or you could uh, use uh, curly brackets because this is a set of numbers, the domain. For the range, we're doing the same thing. So think about how these points are going to cast a shadow onto this vertical axis, and we need to figure out what those are. So we have uh, the very bottom here is negative 8, and then we have negative 3. When we have 2, and this is 7, and then 8. There we go. So those are all of our y points. Uh, curly brackets is fine. They're a set of numbers, so uh, that would be acceptable. Is it a function, yes or no? Um, no, it's not a function because it doesn't pass the vertical line test. If I draw a vertical line here, I'm going to hit two points. So not a function. Uh, this previously was a function because it passes the vertical line test. So that's kind of an example of a set of discrete points. Um, next we talk about nonlinear relationships. And I know this is kind of weird to see this nonlinear linear. We haven't even talked about it yet. And it's actually in lesson three, just how the course set it up. But uh, we're going to go through it anyway. So we have a circle, and we need to figure out the x points that the circle uses and the y points that the circle uses. And um, it's pretty similar to what we've been doing. So if I think about all of my x values, I'm going to use all of these ones in here, all of these along here, all of these along here, and then all those along there. So even though my circle doesn't uh, necessarily cross the line here and here, um, it does extend a bit beyond because my circle drops down right there and then my circle drops down right there. So if we're talking about the x-axis, we're going to figure out what points we're dealing with here. So this is going to be one of these examples where our values are between two things. So the smallest one here is negative 7. The largest one is going to be 2. So we're going to put negative 7 and 2. And then all of my x values are going to be between negative 7 and 2. So I'm going to put x between those two things. And I'm going to say that all of my x values are greater than or equal to negative 7 and less than or equal to 2. So those are all my x values between negative 7 and 2. My y values are going to be a similar type thing. Get rid of all that. My y values are going to go from up here 
to down here. So what is my largest y value? It looks like I have negative 2 down here, and it goes all the way up to 7 at the top. So including my negative 2 and all the way up to 7, my y values are going to be between there and there. So that's the first type of notation. Um, yeah, the brackets one. Uh, so with my x values, my domain, I have negative 7 and then I have 2 with square brackets because I'm going to include those things. And then same thing down here, negative 2 and 7. So those are two different ways to write the exact same thing. Is this a function? Uh, no, it's not, because if I draw a vertical line, I'm going to hit the circle in more than one spot. So not a function. It's a relation. It's a circle. Uh, letter B is a, I like this one a lot. It's kind of tricky, but it kind of makes sense. So X values. These lines, this parabola, it's called a parabola, uh, it's going to go down forever. Forever and ever and ever, getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's going to hit all of the X values. This line's going to go down here. I could always draw a shadow back up to my X axis. Same here, it's going to go up, and I can always draw a shadow back up to that axis. So I'm going to use all of my X values. Now, we wrote this last day as uh, x is contained in the real numbers, or we can write it as negative infinity to infinity. So it's going to use all of the x values. Y is a different story, though. My y values, if I cast a shadow onto this y-axis, all of my y values are going to be below this point. I'm using nothing above it. And that looks like y is equal to 3. So if I wanted to represent that, I would say all of my y values are going to be less than or equal to 3. And I could write that as the smallest y value be negative infinity because that's going down forever, and my largest will be 3. And I guess technically we should put a round bracket on infinity because we're not going to include infinity because we'll never actually get to infinity, which is kind of a strange concept in its own right. So generally speaking, when we deal with infinity, we'll give it a round bracket. Is this a function? Yes. Passes our vertical line test. I can draw a vertical line and only hit one point on that black line. So there we go. I'm hoping that you guys had a chance to look at this so I'm not kind of cruising to it too fast. Uh, this next one's a really strange shape, funny looking line. Kind of does a little bit of a zigzag in the middle there. But we can treat it like any other line. So I see some arrows here. This is going on in either direction forever. I assume it'll be getting higher and higher and if we went on for long enough, um, we'd end up, you know, using all of our x values. So the domain is x is contained in the real numbers or negative infinity to infinity. And my y values are the exact same thing. Negative infinity, positive infinity. So it's going to go up and down and left and right forever, forever. Uh, is it a function? No. If I draw a vertical line here, I'm going to hit one, two, three points. So fails my vertical line test. Not a function. Looks like we have one more here, and then uh, we can move on to lesson three. Domain, the x values. I'm going to end up having this kind of gap in the middle with no x values kind of from here to here. So I'm going to say, okay, what's my, my x value here? Well, that is, looks like negative 3, and then this one's positive 3. So all of my x values are going to be either greater 
than positive 3 or less than negative 3. And I'm not including any of this stuff in the middle because I'm going to miss it all. So this is a kind of a strange one to write down. All of our x values are going to be uh, greater than equal to 3 and less than or equal to negative 3. I could switch the order of those if I wanted to kind of show that the negative first, it doesn't really much matter. Uh, y values, a little bit different story. I'm going to use a y value here, 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 here. That's going to go up forever. It's going to go down forever. Same thing on this side. So I'm going to use all of these y values. I'm going to cast a shadow on the vertical axis everywhere. So we can just write y is contained in the real numbers. Or negative infinity to positive infinity. Uh, I guess I should include the uh, bracket notation here for this guy. Uh, so I'm going to have negative infinity to negative 3. Uh, negative 3 included, so I'll square bracket that guy. And then I'm going to have um, positive 3 to infinity as well. That one's a bit of a strange one, but it is what it is, I guess, so we'll just go with it. So that's domain and range. I think the last page asks you guys to draw your own graphs and come up with some of these things. And uh, if you can, you want, um, go ahead. If you want to submit it and uh, I can check it for you, that's fine. If you don't want to do that, there's a few other examples in the learning guide to look at. So um, there you go. Does anybody have any questions on domain and range before we uh, look at the next section? We're not going to just kind of forget about domain and range, uh, but we just wanted to kind of give you a ton of different examples of things you might encounter, really different graphs, points, lines, curves, uh, just so you kind of encountered all sorts of things. So when you're going through the work and you see something, you can go back and say, okay, yeah, I encountered this already and it turned out this way because of this sort of thing. So uh, that's kind of my hope there. I didn't see anybody typing any questions. How are we feeling about domain and range? It can be a tricky concept. And uh, just throw in the chat, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, meh, okay, good, no. Um, generally speaking, we go into it, or I go into it a little bit more in depth than uh, you probably need. But moving forward in math, it'll help you out because some of the more difficult questions you'll encounter possibly later on. And the hard thing is to judge kind of the difficulty of what sort of things they're going to give you. It does get confusing. Definitely, I would agree with you, Taylor, on that. Um, there's just so many different circumstances. You can make a graph look like literally anything. So um, it's kind of hard. Once you uh, practice it a bit, you get the hang of it. Think about the shadows on the x-axis and the shadows on the y-axis. That might help out. So you got um, kind of people in the middle. It's going okay. Some thumbs up, some thumbs down. Uh, that's pretty good. It's usually where uh, we should be, I guess, after going through something for the first time. You'll have a chance to look at maybe some examples and hopefully uh, becomes a little bit more clear as to how these questions are done. You know, jump into lesson three. So maybe a little bit more straightforward. Um, let's look at it. So uh, the cost for a car rental is $60 plus $20 for every 100 kilometers driven. Uh, so the independent variable is the distance and the dependent variable is the cost. So the cost depends on how far you're going to drive. The more I drive, the more the cost increases. So the cost is dependent on the distance. Um, we'll look at a few more examples of the dependent independent type uh, idea. So we can represent this in a table of values. Uh, one interesting thing that happens here is distance is zero. Even before you've driven anywhere, you rent a car, you pay for that car. So you say, okay, uh, it's cost you $60 just to rent the car, and then you pay uh, an additional $20 per 100 kilometers. So the idea here is for a linear relation, a constant change in the independent variable results in 
constant change in the dependent variable. Now, why does it cost $60 to drive nowhere? It's a really great question. Um, think about any time you rent something, it could be anything. Maybe you go down to City Park, or not City Park, but uh, the one there on Water Street, and you rent a pair of skates. Um, that just costs, you know, like $3 to rent the skates. It's just how things get rented. Um, a lot of times, repairman or something comes to your house, the service call will cost, you know, $100, and then you pay per hour after that as well. It's just kind of how these things work. So you have to pay for the rental of a car and then any additional kilometers. So what do we mean by constant change? Um, what we mean by constant change is as we go down this table, the values are changing the same amount each time. So let's look at it. If I go from 0 to 100, I'm adding 100 to that. If I go from 100 to 200, I'm adding 100. 200 to 300, I'm adding 100, and 300 to 400, I'm adding 100. So each time I go uh, down my distance, I'm adding 100. So what's happening to the cost? Is it changing at a constant rate as well? Is each step on that chart going down giving me the same value? So if I go from 60 to 80, I'm going to add 20. If I go from 80 to 100, I'm adding 20. 100 to 120, I'm adding 20, and 120 to 140, I'm adding 20. So each step in my chart, I'm just going down uh, 20. So it's $20 as the cost, the distance is going down by 100. So even though the change isn't the same, um, even though the change isn't the same, it's constant. Each step is the same. Sorry, Bella, I just got your question here. Um, I can't find the page we're on. If we are in the course, uh, I don't know if this will even load. Yeah, it is still logged in from last day. Uh, unit five, we broke down into two parts, Bell. So uh, the first sort of stuff up to the domain and range is going to be submitted here, hopefully today. And then down here, uh, we're going to end up talking about the lessons part two. So we have another half. Uh, I th are you going to open the lessons for unit five in the course? Yes. I will definitely open the lessons for unit five in the course. Um, I just didn't do it this morning. I'm sorry. I want everyone to kind of finish up that first half before we move on to the second. So just trying to keep everyone together. Uh, I will open it up though. Uh, and then Alex was asking about driving... Uh, in reverse, would the cost go down? Uh, interesting to note, and we're going to actually talk about this once we get into Science 10, uh, the, distance, uh, the difference, I should say, between distance and displacement, which kind of sound the same, but they're different things. So uh, distance is kind of how far you went, and displacement is how far you are from where you started. So uh, it's kind of a silly question, but we actually do spend a lot of time talking about it in science. So at the end of the science uh, unit and physics, we start talking about distance displacement and the differences between these things. So there we go. Alex, you're going to love science. It's lots of fun, promise. So there you go. Um, we had a constant change on one side of our chart, constant change on the other side of the cart. That means it's linear. So we've looked at something that's linear. Maybe we should look at something that's not linear. So we're going to kind of describe this a few different ways. So a set of ordered pairs, um, this is the exact same data set as the table. I've gone from 0 to 100, 100 to 200, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, and then down, I guess I used the wrong color there. Those were blue before. So 0 to 100, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, and then uh, my second data always goes up by... 20. So there we go. Same set of data in ordered pairs. And then if I scroll down a little bit further, it's the exact same data step again, data set again. Um, sorry, I was reading step as I was thinking. Uh, but now we've just represented it as a graph. So it's all the same thing. 
Uh, we have a table of values, we have a set of ordered pairs, and we have a graph, all representing the same data. If you rent a car before you've driven anywhere, as Alex put it, uh, it costs you $60. And then from there, each 100 kilometers costs you another $20. So that's a line that represents that. So we go 100, we pay an extra 20. We go 100, we pay an extra 20. We go 100, we pay 20. Go 100, pay 20. So that is a chart of the exact same data. So this rate of change is probably a new word for us. You might have spent time talking about slope, maybe in grade nine, and slope and rate of change are the same thing. And we're gonna actually spend a lot of time talking about slope. Uh, maybe you've heard the word slope when you're referring to something like a roof of a house. You talk about a really steep slope or a really uh, shallow or low slope. So that's something that maybe it comes up. Um, yeah, I don't know where else we'll see slope or would have seen slope. But we need to kind of define it a little bit further. So when we're talking about the slope, we need to talk about, or the rate of change, we need to talk about our fancy definition. So the rate of change is equal to the change in the dependent variable divided by the change in the independent variable. So that is the rate of change. Uh, there's lots of other ways we can write this, and I think I mentioned this last day, mathematicians are, I didn't call them lazy, but I said they like to use kind of abbreviations and shorthand stuff. So change, uh, when we use the word change, we can represent that with a triangle, which seems really weird. I did call them lazy, Alex. All right, mathematicians are lazy. And uh, instead of writing change, they just draw a triangle. So I can also write this whole rate of change thing uh, as this. Change in Y over change in X. So it's all the same. And I'm just kind of reading through your um, little question here. In the movie Justice League, The Flashpoint Paradox, I run so fast you can travel through time. Can we actually travel through time if we're going fast enough? Um, you won't encounter this until grade 11 physics, um, but uh, there's kind of a universal speed limit and that's the speed of light in a vacuum. So technically speaking, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light um, in a vacuum. So there you go. Even even the flashpoint paradox, the flash can't run that fast, but I guess in the movie he can to make the movie more interesting, which would be really cool. Um, the math breaks down once you get going too fast. Why choose a triangle? I don't know. Uh, Greek letter, actually, it's called delta. So maybe you know your Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma. Uh, there's delta, you have sigma, uh, yeah, there's epsilon. <laughs> I'm trying to remember all of my Greek letters here. There's capital, sigma. Um, mainly, we've used Greek letters, and uh, triangle just happens to be one of the Greek letters, delta. So that's why they use it. Why do we use Greek letters? Uh, the Greeks made large contributions to math, and that was the language that they used, so we've just stuck with it. And uh, that's just kind of, you know, how history kind of evolved. So the rate of change is what? Uh, every kind of step, how much do we go up each 100 kilometers? So 
Uh, in this case, for every 100 kilometers we drive, it costs us an extra $20. So the rate of change is, how much does it change if we drive one kilometer? So if 100 kilometers is 20, what does one kilometer work out to be? So we're just going to divide it by 100. So the rate of change in this example is 20 cents per kilometer. That is, for each additional kilometer driven, the rental cost increases by 20 cents. And the rate of change is constant for a linear relation. So we'll definitely spend lots of time talking about rate of change and slope and all of these sorts of ideas. So if you don't, you're like, where did you get 20 cents from, Mr. Borden? That's just crazy. Um, don't worry, we'll spend lots of time talking about it. Continuing on, we can determine the rate of change from an equation that represents the linear function. Let C be the cost, the distance driven by D, and an equation for the linear function is. All right, so we're going to start with C, the cost of our rental. Now, Alex pointed out at the very beginning, even if we drive zero kilometers, this car rental is going to cost us $60. So it doesn't matter what I have here for my rate of change or anything like that. It's going to cost us $60 plus something else um, to rent this car. So we just need to kind of figure out what that is. Um, now up above we said each kilometer costs us 20 cents. If we drove 100 kilometers, it would cost us $20. So the rate of change is going to go right here, and it's going to be 0 0.20 times the distance. So 20 cents times the distance. If the distance is 100, it's $20. If the distance is one kilometer, it's 20 cents. It doesn't matter what the distance is, this equation will tell us how much the cost was for renting the car. So uh, we always like to come up with an equation, and like I said, once we get into the um, next unit, we'll spend lots of time talking about how to come up with these equations. But for now, you're just going to have to maybe trust me. So we have the cost, uh, which is the dependent variable. And we have the distance, which is the dependent variable, or independent, I should say. And then we have this 20, which is the rate of change. And then we have our 60 here on the end, which is the initial cost. Some things won't have an initial cost. So to like, I'm trying to think of something, doesn't have an initial cost. I'm, I'm fresh out of ideas. Uh, Alex is harassing me for my units, which I appreciate because units are extremely important. I think you specify that it is in kilometers because somebody could think it's in centimeters or feet or something like that, which is true. Uh, I guess that kind of gets covered here. Uh, the, the D is in kilometers. It kind of says it in the paragraph here. So the distance is in kilometers. We've kind of written that out or it was written for us already. So that's kind of where that comes from, I guess. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Tool rentals. I guess, yeah, if you rented a jackhammer, um, you just pay per day. There's kind of no initial cost. You rent it for zero days, you pay zero dollars. You rent it for one day, you pay $20. You rent it for two days, $40. Three days is $60. That's a good one. Um, for that, I'm sure you guys have come up with all sorts of other things. We'll look at other examples that don't have an initial cost. Um, all right, so which 
relation is linear, justify the answer. So we're going to look at um, we're going to look at some further examples, and we're going to see if this is linear or not. So you guys are doing planning. Um, have you guys gone to the finances unit when you're dealing with uh, purchasing a vehicle yet? I don't know if you guys have started finances or not. I guess probably not. Last time I heard from Mrs. Wood, you were doing uh, course selection sort of stuff. So my blueprint, that sort of thing. So we're going to actually talk a little bit about this in your uh, ADC class, purchasing a vehicle is an assignment you guys will do. So here's a little bit of uh, information or just something to think about, I guess. So a new car, let's say it costs you $24,000. Every year, the value of the car on average decreases by 15%. So the value is related to time. The older the car, the, um, the less it will cost or the more it depreciates, I guess. So every year, the value decreases by um, 15%. So there's kind of two ways to look at this. Uh, the value is going down by 15%, but how much is the car worth still? Well, if I took that 15% and multiplied it by the 24,000, I would get an answer as to how much the value has gone down by, but then I have to do subtraction to figure out how much the car is actually worth. So is there a way to represent um, this going down by 15% as the actual value of the car, just to kind of save a calculation? And there is. If you took 100%, that's how much the car is worth, and then you subtract from it 15%, you're gonna end up with 85%. So instead of taking away 15% each year, we could just take 85% of the, uh, the cost and we would end up at the same spot, just with fewer calculations. Uh, Abby, I know you meant um, 85 there, just some mental math. Uh, all good. So, actually, we might even need to do a, a calculation using our calculator today, which is rare in the next few units, but here we go. Uh, zero years. So, you buy your car brand new from the dealership. The car is worth $24,000. That's how much you paid for it. There you go. So, after one year, it's going to lose 15% of its value. So we need to figure out what 85% of 24,000 is. And we're going to go 0.85 times 24,000. We get $20,400. Okay. Another year passes. Our car started out at the beginning uh, as 24. Our first year passes. We're down to 20,400. Another year passes we're gonna lose an additional 15%. So we're gonna start with the 20,400 and we're gonna take another 85% of that. And we're gonna end up with 17,340. On your calculator, if uh, some of you are actually doing this calculation, sometimes calculators will allow you to just hit equals and it'll keep doing the same calculation again and again and again, uh, which is kind of handy in this sort of scenario. So we have 17,340, and then after an additional year, we're gonna lose another 15%, so we're gonna have 85 of what we started with, or 85%. So we're gonna end up at 14,739. And that is what Alex has entered into the chat there. He actually took it to a fourth year and ended up with 12,528. And it can keep going and going and going until your car is worth nothing after a long enough period of time, uh, which sometimes happens. All right. So the idea here is that um, we need to kind of look at these values and figure out if we're dealing with a linear function or not. That was kind of the original question or the point of doing this type of calculation. So when we started, we said, okay, uh, at the very beginning, a constant change in our dependent variable equals a constant change in the independent variable. All right, do we have a constant change in both of our variables? This is going from zero to one, so I'm adding one. From one to two, I'm adding one. From one to three, or two to three, I'm adding one. That's looking good. Uh, we're always adding one. 
that's a constant change. So for the first variable, we have a constant change. That's good. How about on the other side here? Are we dealing with a constant change here? This first step, uh, I went down by negative 3,600. So I decreased by 3,600. And then in the next step, what happened? Well, I went down again, but this time I went down 3,060. And then the next step again, I went down by negative 2,601. So all of my values in my first column here, these guys were constant over here. They were going down by one. Now I'm dealing with these values, and these are not constant. Have you guys used the three dot abbreviation for therefore? Have you guys seen that one before? Therefore, this is not linear. All right, so three dots together is therefore. It's another abbreviation. By the end of this math course, you guys will be masters at being lazy in your writing. And I'm not talking like text speak, like LOL and MSG for message and all that. I'm talking about real understandable lazy. There'll be thousands of mathematicians around that can understand your laziness now. Taylor's seen it before. Uh, there's questions about multiplying by um, 85%. So generally speaking, calculators won't have a percent button. You just divide it by 100. 85 divided by 100 gives us 0.85. So that usually works um, for that. Let's keep on moseying through this. Uh, for a service call, an electrician charges $75 flat rate plus $50 for each hour he works. The total cost for service is related to time. I actually ran into this the other day. Uh, my dryer at home died, my clothes dryer. And it was like an initial $30 fee. And then it was $6 a minute for somebody to come look at my dryer. And I'm cheap, so I said no. And I just tore it apart myself and literally almost... Three weeks later, I just got some parts yesterday, installed it, it works. I saved myself a bunch of money, um, and I didn't pay somebody $6 a minute to f undo a couple screws on my dryer. Literally a screwdriver, only thing holding your dryer together. Pretty amazing. All right, so let's try to fill out a table of values for kind of the information we're given here. For a service call, electrician charges $75 and then $50 for each hour. So this is that same idea that Alex was making fun of before. At a time, zero hours, even before that person shows up to your house, they've charged you $75. And then each hour, we increase by $50. Let's go up a little bit for you here. Um, therefore, not linear. That was the idea of the question there, Abby, was, was this a linear function or not? Not linear because we're not going down by the same rate. All right, so after one hour, uh, we had that initial 75, and then we're going to add up 50 to it, so we're up to 125 at one hour. Two hours is going to be 175. Three hours is going to be 225. So just adding 50 for each hour. Um, Taylor's is mentioning her dog, $50 flat rate to examiner, and then everything else on top of that. Hopefully your dog's okay, Taylor. Uh, and Alex, yeah, that's just kind of the risk we run when we... Bring people into our house to fix things. All right, so is this constant? Is this linear? I, if I look down this left side, I'm adding one, I'm adding one. Each step here, I'm adding one. So on this side, 
I'm constant. On the other side, what am I doing each step? So even though I started at 75, I'm adding 50. And then I'm adding 50 again. And then I'm adding 50 again. And then you guessed it, I'm adding 50 again. So this is constant. So is this a linear function? I'm going to use my three dots again. Uh, therefore, this is linear. My dependent variable and independent variable both increase at a constant rate. No worries, Sheena. Welcome. You know what? There's money to be made. I couldn't even get the parts in Clone Alex. I had to order them online. So there you go. Uh, the definition for linear, uh, we wrote it up above here, Taylor. Uh, where was it? Um, for a linear relation, here's the definition for linear right at the top of the first page. Uh, the constant change in the independent variable and constant change in the dependent variable. So as long as they're both uh, changing at a constant rate, you're okay. Meaning that uh, you know the jump from one line to the next is the same. And remember, we could write these in ordered pairs or look at a graph. Uh, the easiest way to identify something is linear or not is to look at a graph of it. So let's draw a few little charts in here. Uh, and we'll, there's going to be one little graph, draw another graph here. Let's look at uh, four examples that I have written down here. All right, uh, if I had something like this, a straight line, that red guy there, if I wrote that as an equation, it would be something like, uh, x plus y equals 8. That is a linear equation. How about if I had something like this, a completely vertical line? Is that linear? Yep, that's linear. That looks like x is equal to 1. How about if I had a completely horizontal line? Is that linear? Yep, that looks like y is equal to, we'll go with 5. And then if I had something like, let's go with something like that. Um, that might be something like y is 2x minus 3. So these are all examples of linear equations. This is what the graph looks like. This is what the equation looks like. Let's look at some nonlinear ones, and then maybe we'll just compare. So let's do another four over here. One, two, three, four. All right, if I had something like this, we call it a parabola. Why is that not linear? Well, it's not a straight line. So, uh, great question, Abby. How do you know what the equation looks like? You don't. Uh, I'm just making them up as I go. Um, we will learn what the equations look like moving forward, but for now, I just want to show you some linear and show you some nonlinear, and I want you guys to compare and kind of come up with your own definition of what linear or nonlinear is just based on what you see, so just based on observation. So the equation for something like this is going to be y is equal to x squared. That gives you a parabola. If I have a line that comes maybe down like this, goes across, this one is y is equal to x cubed. Uh, if I had a circle, which we dealt with in the domain and range stuff, I don't know about that circle, but close enough. That's going to be something like x squared plus y squared equals, we'll go 4. I think that was the example we used in class. That's the equation there. And if I have y is the square root of x, that's going to give me a line that looks like that. 
So, what do we think? Comparing these things, how can you tell if you're dealing with a linear equation or a nonlinear equation? Um, the idea here is that linear is going to give us a straight line, and nonlinear.